Thank you for coming back, because now we have a very exciting final plenary session. Rosie and Herveyer, the director of GrandCraft, will be moderating the session on collaboration as a means of progress and development. Participants on this panel include Dr. Oheneba Boachia J, the uh, founder and president of Focus, the mayor of Thessaloniki, Yanis Boutaris, who is on his way here from the airport, Mr. Martin Evans, the chief executive of Carnegie UK Trust, Mr. Gary Oppenheimer, founder and executive director of AmpleHarvest.org, and Mrs. Marta Solsona, the program management of international programs of La Caixa Foundation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is going to be hard at the end of this conference, at the end of a long day, after such a brilliant speech by Mr. Kasparov. Um, but I can assure you, uh, we will work hard to um, try and provide you with some of the experience that is in this panel. Um, George Soros said this morning, that all human institutions can benefit from improvement. That also applies to philanthropy. And uh, the EFC, the European Foundation Center, and GrantCraft, the project that it houses, are, um, have as a task to help that happen. And we are very honored that the Stavros Miarkos Foundation invited us to moderate this panel. Um, about collaboration as a means of progress and development. And that has been said several times over the last two days. Uh, as philanthropy, as foundations, we can make a difference, but we have to collaborate, we have to work together. Um, so are we? And how good are we at working together? All the people in this panel work in a collaborative way. And they will share with you not only what they do, but they will explain how they work together across sectors and with other actors, and what they learned about how to make those partnerships effective. Um, after their presentations, um, we also very much want to hear from you, particularly in Greece, how philanthropy and philanthropists can work together uh, with other actors. Um, what is your secret ingredient? What are your special challenges? Um, we are having translation, so feel free also to ask your questions in Greek. But now first our presentations, starting with Dr. Boachi. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and I appreciate the invitation, and I'm very pleased to be here to be part of this panel to share our experience on global health and the challenges of building a hospital in Ghana, where I come from this one, right? It's not changing. Can you advance the slides for me? Right, so there are some key facts that you are all aware of, but I need to reiterate, and that is musculoskeletal conditions or orthopedics causes pain and physical disability and loss of personal and economic independence and affects millions of people of all ages in all cultures. And as we talk about working together, uh, we need to know that the key fact for orthopedic conditions is that it's the second greatest cause of disability as measured by years lived with disability worldwide and across most regions of the world. Back pain, neck pain, arthritis of the hips and knees, these are all common. And the prevention and treatment of these conditions and injuries should be among the leading major health concerns in the minds, actions, and fundraising priorities of international health agencies, governments, non-governmental organizations, medical and research communities, funders, media, and the general public. This has been embraced by the Born and Joint Decade, which has been served. When you go to underdeveloped nations, the challenges are numerous. First is the human resources. There's a lack of expertise, high labor turnover, lack of commitment, there's a huge knowledge gap, and then lack of management and leadership skills. Just using Ghana as an example, we have 26.5 million people, 172 hospitals, 35% by religious groups, 
the specialists are very meager, and for 26.5 million people, there are 15 orthopedic surgeons. And on my block alone in New York, we have 100 orthopedic surgeons. So for one orthopedic surgeon to take care of one, more than one million people, you can imagine the amount of what the person has to do. So our vision is to establish a sustainable infrastructure for state-of-the-art orthopedic care and education. And the mission is to provide optimum orthopedic care and improve quality of life. This uh, uh, lighthouse was built in the 18th century by the Portuguese, where we would like to conform or transform into a better light, lighthouse that will cure and uh, save lives. So we just completed a $16 million 50-bed orthopedic hospital in Ghana, starting with a seed money of $1.5 million from the government to build this complex, which has been in operation for the past two years. I work at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. There we provide excellent care. Now at Focus, what we try to do is to provide relevant care, which means applica applicability to real world issues, present day events or current so state of society, being more useful and more suitable and desirable in the present situation. So we compromise by doing it in an ethically progressive manner so that we do not cause any harm. So for the past 20 years, 15, 18 years that I've been doing this, uh, starting with uh, working at the government hospitals until we built our own, we have had about 475 international volunteers that have worked with us to be able to achieve this program. And it's an included surgeons, nurses, anesthesiologists, basically all disciplines of healthcare. And these are some groups that have joined us on our uh, trips to Ghana, pay people from United States, Mexico, Argentina, India, Spain, Norway. We've had them from Greece, also sponsored by the Neahos Foundation. And I will say that the best part has been my three sons who I've worked with, all of whom are in healthcare and hopefully will take over one day. And uh, the human resource challenge has been numerous and we recognize the need to build capacity as we talked about this morning. Professional development programs working with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, and then instituting local training programs like spinal cord monitoring so that we can do complex spine surgery. There are several constraints, the environmental constraints, inconsistent utilities, water, energy. I have spent more money building generators than buying orthopedic equipment. And these are water tanks that we have established so that we can have our uh, reverse osmosis water purified to be able to provide a complex. There's also inadequate technical expertise to operate and maintain the equipment. The challenges are numerous, and the orthopedic problems will tax any orthopedic surgeon in the first world, like these conditions that you see. As a spine surgeon, I've seen cases that in New York it probably take me several months to even address, and about half a million dollars to take care of them. But this is what we're faced with uh, at Focus. So with the help of the Neahos Foundation, we're able to build the surgical suites. So we have state-of-the-art orthopedic facility where we can provide the care that we need for these complex uh, deformities that you saw. And this is an example of a kid who came to us, difficulty breathing, put her in traction for four months, and then able to do complex reconstruction on her and give her another new lease uh, on life. The finances, finances are very inadequate. There's inadequate funding sources. This $16 million, million dollar hospital probably costs probably more than 200 to 300 million dollars if we were built in the first world. So lack of commercial insurance plans, affordability of quality care provided is not available. It's a higher cost of doing business. And there's a non-philanthropic culture of the general populace in most parts of Africa and the attitude of people that everything should be free of charge is prevalent. Uh, in Ghana alone, the government spent 6.2% of the GB GDP on health care, or $30 per capita. That's not enough for even a single spine screw, which costs $1,000 in the United States. Of that, approximately 34% was government expenditure. So we have been able to treat about 26,000 patients since we started. And that has saved the government probably $100 million in healthcare costs just by doing this with philanthropic support and collaborating with government and others. And these are all our donors, Stavos, Neahoses in the middle, uh, supporting our surgical suites. 
a hospital for special surgery where I work. It's been a big supporter with our, our volunteers and all the medical device companies that I have worked with over the years are sp supporting this also. And these are uh, uh, Stavros uh, uh, ambassadors, uh, uh, Papadopoulos and uh, Takis, uh, who came in in 19... Uh, uh, Papadopoulos has been coming for the past eight years, and he continues to travel with us. So meeting the challenges, we've been able to overcome that with international volunteers, private donors, in-kind donation by medical device companies, the local government and public support, local revenue generating services like the pharmacy, the lab imaging, and then we're lucky sometimes to have paying patients and we consider that as medical tourism, which allows us to meet our challenges and the goals. So we can turn these patients around and give them smiling faces and uh, hopefully we'll continue to meet the future challenges such as building a training center to build more capacity for the next generation. Thank you. Our next speaker um, with um, um, a, a different uh, collaborative project in a different environment um, is going to be Martin Evans, Chief Executive of Carnegie UK Trust. Thank you uh, very much and thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, our trust was founded a, hun founded a hundred years ago by Andrew Carnegie at the time as the richest man in the world. Uh, we're based in Scotland and we have something in common with this beautiful country of Greece. Um, although we cover the entire UK, Scotland has 94 inhabited islands uh, with all those challenges of ferries, remoteness, uh, scale and infrastructure. And I was thinking that maybe at some stage in the future we would collaborate on a project about uh, islands uh, together uh, with the foundation. We are best known in the UK for building o over 600 libraries. Each one of these was a partnership. Um, we would build uh, and donate the library on condition that the local government would pay for the books and the staffing. We got a very good deal out of that partnership over the last 100 years. Uh, there remain uh, almost 600 Carnegie libraries in the UK and 2,000 around the world. Our trust in its approach, I ask our staff to have these attitudes, and I'll discuss them slightly more uh, uh, in, in a second. We want to engage in bold, persistent experimentation. Uh, we want thoughtful partnership and cooperation. And we are not seeking impact as our primary objective, and I'll come back to that. Bold experimentation is easier said than done. And the issue that we always risk is our reputation and it's not our money. If we're going to do something that's bold and experiment, people are not always going to approve of it. And this is an example. We wanted to build a lodge uh, in the remote parts of the United Kingdom, we didn't mind where, to encourage people without access to private transport to visit and to spend time, which was more difficult if you didn't have a car. It was rejected by a whole range of areas. They were worried about people littering the countryside. They were worried about uh, vandalism and disrespect. Uh, this is built uh, in the Trossachs. This is our kind of lodge in the Trossachs. A beautiful building, still attracting uh, 100,000 visitors a year. At the time, uh, we had a lot of criticism uh, for this project. I'll talk a little bit more about a different form of partnership, but this is our other major partnership project, again taking risk. As you may know, in the United Kingdom, we've had a serious problem with, uh, over the recent years with trust in our newspaper industry. And we're working on a project about better regulation, better journalism, and funding a range of private organization, organizations to improve news gathering at the local level. Without the local news, local democracy is less able to be held to account. And lastly, the, on the attitude side, it's about impact. It's not that impact is not important, it's critically important. But if you ask the CEO of any successful business about what they're trying to achieve, I wouldn't trust the businesses which said, I'm trying to achieve the maximum amount of profit. What you'd want them to say is, I'm trying to build the best aircraft, I'm trying to find the best way of delivering the service, I want the best mobile phone. Profit is the measure 
by which success is what you measure success by. It's not what you chase. If you chase profit, and there's plenty of businesses that try to chase profit, you end up with short-termism and failing. And the other thing, and it's our second key precious commodity, time. We built, or we donated over a thousand playing fields over the life of a uh, thousand playing fields of towns and uh, villages across the United Kingdom and Ireland. It's hard to know what that impact is in the first two, three, five years. You don't have a McKinsey consultant going out testing a number of joggers to give an impact. 60 years later, you can see this little triangle of, of a field has made a massive difference to this town, and it's the same everywhere else. That's our advantage in, in foundations. We can take a very, very long view, and that is a massive privilege. So, very briefly, our challenge that we have set ourselves in partnership is town centre uh, and what is happening to our town centres. You probably know this, they are in freefall decline. It's a combination of out of uh, town shopping centres, supermarkets, and online shopping. Uh, when we were looking at this problem, we needed to find something that was positive. We needed an asset approach rather than a deficit approach. We needed to latch onto something which was positive to make a difference. And there are many people working in this area. Our process was this, research. We're a very strongly research-based organization. What our research was finding was, amongst young people, not from the elite universities, they still aspire to be in the civil service, uh, big business, corporations, and indeed foundations. It was people from the technical colleges, had a wellspring of entrepreneurial <coughs> spirit, but no opportunity and little confidence. We then set out to say, well, wait, can we find a town which would host an experiment? And if all meetings look like this one, I'll be delighted. I spend most of my uh, life in meetings. They are not as well-dressed, they're not as pleasant as looking as this, and they're certainly not as attentive. We spent about a, a six months looking for a town to, to work with us, which we did find. And then we did what we do quite well. We had a party, which was great, we invited everyone to that town and said, this is what we're going to do with you. And then the most scary thing was we then start, sent out invitations to youth groups and schools and uh, colleges. Would you like to join a competition? Uh, there was silence for a long time, three or four weeks. And then eventually 500 applied and we chose the 10 best and it's called Test Town and its final is tomorrow. Test Town is a group of 10 young people, all of whom have been given business support, shops, uh, mentoring, uh, 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 resources, uh, uh, money to help them experiment with opening a shop in Dunfermline. Uh, we promoted this, we've had all sorts of things going on in the press, and as I said, the final is tomorrow. So my conclusion is this, this is our philanthropy, philanthropy formula, it may be not be yours, it's three things. The first is treasure, we have money, and that allows us to open doors, but not much more. Secondly, we, we want to bring thought. That's not just our own thought. We want to encourage a whole range of people to be thinking critically about what we're doing and to constructively criticize our ideas. And most important, we bring time. We can look for the long term and we can take time to let each of those processes evolve. And finally, with all that, with luck, we'll have impact. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. We move on to Marta Solsona of La Caixa Foundation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to begin my presentation by thanking, thanking the Niarcos Foundation for inviting me to speak to you today. I wanted to take this opportunity to share with you some experiences of collaboration between La Caixa Foundation and um, some of our partners in the field of the international cooperation. Uh, firstly, I will start uh, by telling briefly who, who uh, we are. La Caixa Foundation is a Spanish entity committed to human rights, peace, justice, and people's dignity. Our mission is to contribute to the advance of people and society with particular emphasis on the most vulnerable groups. We work through our own programs, as well as through alliances and partnerships with third parties with, with we, which we, we share mission and values. 
Um, our objective is uh, to achieve effective and innovative actions to obtain sustainable social transformation and to generate opportunities for people. Our main lines of action are developing social programs in Spain and, in inter and international cooperation programs in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, promoting cultural activities, uh, fostering educational activities, developing environmental programs, supporting research, and fostering the dissemination of science and technology. Uh, I'm sorry. Today I'm going to focus on the International Cooperation Program, which started in 1997 with the objective of helping to eradicate poverty in, develop in developing countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In order to ensure a, a greater efficiency when addressing resources and promoting developing projects, we always work in collaboration with third parties. These are uh, Spanish and international NGOs, multilateral organizations, the private, the private sector, mainly Spanish uh, companies, the academic sector, and of course the Spanish society. And we have uh, four main, main ways of collaborating. Giving funds in order to promote new opportunities, training NGOs because we want to promote the professionalization of the third sector, promoting social uh, responsibility of the Spanish companies and of the Spanish citizens, and involving society in our programs and activities. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you some particular examples. Let's move on to the first one, which is collaborating with the Spanish and local NGOs. From the very beginning of our program, we have focused uh, on supporting sustainable developing projects in countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Our objective is to promote and support processes base, based on creating employment and generating economic activity. So we support the setup of micro companies, cooperatives, and other income generating processes. For this, we have an annual call for projects where Spanish non-governmental organizations present proposals together with their local partners. In fact, these local NGOs take a very active role in organizing the processes and providing economic and human resources. In the end, we want to generate substantial changes in the life of local communities by increasing incomings of families. We also want to prevent aid dependency and we, we also want to strengthen local capacities. Let me give you an example of project set up in San Juan de los Colorados in Ecuador. In this project, we support two processing plants of fruits and chocolate, and we implement a marketing system based on the, based on the principles of the social economy and fair trade. To do this, we work with a Spanish NGO, uh, Ecosol, and with an Ecuadorian NGO, Makita Kushunsi Comercializando Como Hermanos. Um, the project also strengthens local cooperatives and second grade organization, all this in order to ensure the sustainability. When promoting this kind of activities, we, th we not only give funds, we also offer our experience. We have supported more than 500 developing projects in 62 countries. So we are in close contact with Spanish and local NGOs. In this sense, uh, this year we have started an online platform of communication where all the NGOs that are working with us can share experiences, best practices, and follow online training courses. And we also offer other strategic resources. In 2007, we set up a corporate volunteering program, which we call Cooperantes Caixa. This is a part of La Caixa Corporate Social Responsibility. And this is another way of cooperation between the private sector and the nonprofit organization, and in this case, with no funds. Um, 
Cooperantes Caixa offers to the partner organizations the highly skilled professional profile of, of La Caixa employees to reinforce this, their own capacities. And, like, and the La Caixa employees offer to the organizations their, no, their knowledge on microfinances, marketing, human resources, and so on. Now, I'm going to give you another example, in this case, um, of collaboration with society. I would like to highlight the case of the earthquake in IT in January 2010. Uh, in this case, La Caixa Foundation started a campaign for helping Haiti and opened a bank account to which donations can be made. After three months, this account managed to get contributions from 60,000 people and for a total amount of 3 million euros. A further, a further 800,000 million were added to this total as an extra donation of La Caixa. All these contributions have been allocated in different projects implemented by NGOs specialized in humanitarian aid. And after this record of citizen mobilization, we decided to develop an exhibition called I Haiti 34 Seconds After. This exhibition wanted to report the efforts, the solidarity, and the spirit of overcome hardship of the Haitian people. It also aimed to show the role of the various agents involved in the humanitarian emergency and to reflect the importance of the international solidarity. The exhibition is a part of our program of activities, such as exhibitions, conferences, workshops, and educational issues that are aimed to contributing to educating Spanish society in a culture of peace and tolerance and to engage Spanish uh, citizens in our programs. And finally, uh, I would like to talk about the child vaccination program, which, which we are running in collaboration with Gavi Alliance, and which is a clear example of the great impact that can be achieved through alliances and partnerships. Gavi Alliance is the first world alliance in the public and private sector that fights against child mortality in the poorest countries. Gavi's achievements are outstanding. And from La Caixa Foundation, we not only contribute financially with Gavi Alliance, but also by giving to Gavi the possibility of working with uh, La Caixa with um, Spanish companies. This is through uh, the Business Alliance for Child Vaccination. This is an innovative corporate social responsibility initiative addressed at the Spanish companies who wish to join the fight against child mortality. This is an excellent, ex excellent opportunity for social action, open to all companies, small, medium, and large, since donations can be made from 1,000 euros. We, uh, we really believe that it's important to work in collaboration, combining the efforts of public and private agents because it makes possible to optimize result, results and achievement. And as the African uh, saying goes, if you, if you want to go fast, go on your own. If you want to go far, then go with others. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Um, the next collaborative experience will be shared with you by Gary Oppenheimer, the founder and executive director of Ample Harvest. Thank you. I hope you, it's okay if I walk around when I talk. Can you hear me? All righty. We're going to be talking about ampleharvest.org, how this program developed. I'm going to try to keep the pace fast because there's a lot of information to put, bring in. But first, I want to talk about the problem itself, the scope of hunger and malnutrition in America. We have a circumstance in America where we have 50 million people who are food insecure, side by side with 40 million people who grow food in home gardens, often more than they can use, preserve, or share with friends. We also have a situation in America because of the diet for many people that right now one out of three children in America is going to be diabetic and we're quickly drifting to one out of two. That one out of four children in America is living in a food insecure home except if they're Hispanic, then it's one out of three. 
This map represents the sum of the people in America who are food insecure if you combine the population of these 23 of our 50 states. This is telling you the impact on our health care system and our overall health. The ones in red are food-related illnesses. What I wanted you to understand is that the food that we get has a major impact on our overall well-being. And it goes to the point that in the bigger picture, this is not a them issue, this is an us issue. It actually affects the entirety of the um, country. The United States is one of those circumstances where the population is both exceedingly well-fed and malnourished at the same time. How do we deal with hunger in the United States? We have food drives. And it starts with people being asked to bring food to um, uh, a food drive. It might be in a house of worship, school, place of business. The food gets distributed to one of 203 food banks in America. These are large industrial warehouses. And from there, the food's redistributed to 33,500 food pantries across America. These may be in a house of worship. They can be in a civic building. The one thing the system can't handle is fresh food. The problem is that the, the delivery cycle does not allow for fresh food to be delivered, which means the people using food pantries generally are only getting access to processed food. Well, there are 40 million people like me who grow food in home gardens. These are some of my harvests, and often we're growing more than we can use, preserve, or share with friends, and it often ends up in the waste stream. This is a missed opportunity, and it's actually also bad for the environment. You can't go through America and go down the road and see a sign like this because it doesn't exist. Food pantries are generally not easily findable on the internet. There's no signs out front, so even if you wanted to give, you can't. In March of 2009, I had an idea, and that was, what if we took the food and we did something different? What if we connected the dots? What if we bypassed the food bank system and moved the food directly into a local food pantry? Now, I'm going to pause for a second. I want to highlight something, because it, when I created ampleharvest.org in, in May of 2009, the very first thing that I did is I reached out to the very organizations I couldn't deliver the fresh food, the 203 food banks. And I said, I had a really good idea. Can you help me reach these 33,500 food pantries? This collaboration has been vital to the success of ampleharvest.org. And the food banks uh, owned up, and they've been helping us get the food pantries actually registered. What America was suffering was a digital disconnect. The community didn't know about the food pantries. The food pantries did not know about the food in the communities. So food pantries register on ampleharvest.org. It's a free process. They put in their information. A grower who has too much food in his or her garden puts, says where they live. A list of pantries comes up. And then the information comes up about the actual food pantry itself. The key thing here is that we're connecting the dots. And the result is that pantries start getting donations of food like this. And the important thing is it allows 40 million people in America to become philanthropists. A $2 packet of seeds can become a couple hundred dollars worth of food, and they're giving to a food pantry for the rest of their gardening life. We're solving hunger in America by moving information instead of moving food. We're allowing people to reach into their backyards instead of their back pockets to help their neighbors in need. For too many people who can't give charity because their cash struck, uh, it's too tight, this is a solution for doing it. One of the interesting things about ampleharvest.org is that we have the growers themselves deliver the food to the local food pantry. And the, that means for ampleharvest.org, we have zero logistics. It's fully distributed across the country. And it also means no matter how much it scales up, we have no incremental cost. For the community, what it actually means is that the food is freshly harvested, gets to a food pantry, and gets to the clients within hours. The people at the food pantry get food that's fresher than you and I can buy in a supermarket. The, soup, the pantries, because of that process, don't need extra refrigeration, and they don't need extra storage. And lastly, the community itself is engaged in a process of taking care of itself. The impact and the reach. I'm not going to read all of these, but suffice it to say that ampleharvest.org has a major impact on the environment on the community's well-being, and on the health of the community itself. This is a representation. I want you to see one pantry that's registered here near the White House in Washington, C. This is Miriam's Kitchen. And that circle represents about a nine-mile radius, 250 give or take square miles. Now imagine that pantry's on ampleharvest.org, and growers within that radius can find, ample harvest, can find that pantry and donate food. Some of, those grow, some of those people are in an urban setting, many of them in a suburban and rural setting. But that's about an 11 minute drive from the left edge all the way to the food pantry. So I want you to visualize a dot 
with a circle like this and the opportunity it's created. The key thing about ampleharvest.org is our metric is not how many pounds of food you got in. In our case, you can't do it. How do you compare watermelon and parsley donations? Pounds is an irrelevant number. What we're talking about is the opportunity we've created for people across America to donate food. This is the opportunity that we've created. The problem is this map is out of date. It was done this morning, and currently it's 6,175 food pantries as of an hour ago. Pantries keep on adding themselves. They're saying to the community, we're here, we really need your help. So draw that orange circle around each of these dots. And by the way, while Alaska and Hawaii are not on the map, they have pantries too that are registered on ampleharvest.org. These are some of the partners that we have, some of the partners that are funding us, that are helping us. Google's been an immense supporter with $40,000 a month of free um, AdWords advertising. The White House has been very, very helpful. The President's office, Michelle Obama, has both written and spoken about ampleharvest.org. We keep to a very narrow focus. We do not get out of our mission, but we partner all over the place with other organizations, government organizations, the National Council of Churches, faith community, Let's work together to get the job done. As long as we stay in our space and they stay in our space, we can go a great distance together, and that's what's made ampleharvest.org as successful and as impactful as it's been in the short period of time. Now, ampleharvest.org was built for the United States, but the model can replicate on a global scale. And before I flew here to Greece this week, I stopped off in Israel, where the Israeli food bank system called Leked Israel built an app after we'd spent some time talking to them that for the design for the Israeli system replicates what ampleharvest.org is doing. And that's their app. It's a gorgeous app. I went to their food bank. This is a combination of food that they glean from farms and production as well as food that comes in from growers. The point is the model can be adapted to other countries, I think almost every country in the world. <sighs> Jamie Oliver says, eat healthier. Michelle Obama says, eat healthier and exercise. Michael Pollan says, eat not too much, mostly plants. They're all saying the same thing, eat healthier. But for the millions of Americans who don't have access to healthy food, ampleharvest.org is enabling what they're advocating. What we do is we educate, encourage, and enable the gardeners across the country to end hunger in their own community. This is a food donation that came in to a food pantry in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport happens to be a uh, rundown urban town, and this is what came in. The important thing that you need to understand is that we're not feeding people. We're getting people fed. This is the supply of food that comes in from the, uh, from the community. This was a donation from my own garden to a food pantry from last year. This is a solution that doesn't involve government. As a matter of fact, the USDA's food programs are massive. Ampleharvest.org brings it back into the community. Originally, helping, your neighbors, helping hungry neighbors was a community function. You shared food. This is the opportunity for people in America and, frankly, globally, to be sharing food with their neighbors in need again. It doesn't involve government. It doesn't involve money. All it takes is an ample harvest and a heart. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the, word, the floor is yours. I will speak Greek. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to mention our experience uh, at the municipality and the things we are trying to do. The municipality of Thessaloniki has uh, the main aim in all its activities to enhance its work by cooperating with uh, the private sector, enterprises, NGOs, and the uh, philanthropy sector. What we want to do is not to have others substitute us we w or to shift our responsibilities to others. Our objective is for us to improve our mission and work for our citizens with the participation and support of others, volunteers, enterprises, and so on and so forth. At the same time, we have managed to raise awareness of our citizens and uh, to de-Sovietize the system. What do I mean by this uh, new term is that uh, in Greece, we expect everything to come from the state. 
as in the Soviet Union. And now we have to stop. So we think that through the active participation of the citizens, we can improve the situation tremendously, be it cleaning the streets or offering social services. This objective is achieved first by donations in kind and in money, that is, by enhancing our material resources at dire times when each euro counts. At the same time, we want to cooperate with NGOs in order to implement innovative policies. Of course, we do not monopolize knowledge, and it's for the benefit of our citizens to learn from others while planning and implementing our policies. At the same time, we want to bypass the anachronistic and backwards mentality found in certain services. We want to cooperate with companies in the third sector specialized in issues of public health and uh, public policies. And at the same time, we want to cooperate uh, with the Greek NGOs. So we believe that uh, cooperation with them uh, will create the possibility to achieve new know-how to our services in the municipality. Now, these partnerships can offer economies of scale, first of all, since successful programs are scaled up if everybody participates instead of reproducing a specific version of a specific social policy, be it a food pantry or a shelter for the homeless. Speedy decision taking if these decisions have no financial impact on the municipality. So we want to have, a, to have a public policies with cooperation with NGOs in order to achieve the speed of the private sector in order to cater for a public need. Thirdly, we want to enhance our municipality by hiring specialized people, or, or rather by cooperating with specialized people, because we cannot hire new staff. In other words, we improve our staff, we improve our work through cooperation with uh, organizations of the private sector. In this way, we upgrade the quality of our permanent staff with continuous education and learning about excellent good practices. Now, we choose on the basis of the trustworthiness of the organizations and their impact. As regards social policy, this means that we want to cooperate with organizations with the mission to offer a series of support services uh, to the afflicted uh, social strata. Services such as soup kitchens, uh, legal aid uh, to people that uh, are at risk of eviction or bankruptcy, as well as professional, uh, professional uh, advice. Uh, we make no distinction between multinationals or Greek companies. Everybody is for us the same if they are according to these criteria. Of course, in times of crisis, our activities, uh, the activities mentioned before, is a priority for us. And uh, we really want to cooperate with third parties on all issues. Within this framework, the municipality of Thessaloniki has... Uh, accepted uh, grants from 40 organizations in kind, uh, such as food and uh, books and so on and so forth. These uh, organizations uh, were banks, uh, supermarkets, enterprises, Greek uh, uh, enterprises, all multinationals. Uh, we have taken grants uh, from uh, various uh, uh, companies uh, such as uh, Carrefour, Marinopolo, Supermarkets, uh, Cosmote, Lidl, Barilla, as well as uh, Bodosakis Foundation uh, and Bodosakis Foundation, Stavros Nyarchos Foundation, especially as regards uh, the future library program and uh, the um, housing or the shelter program for the homeless. And we also have the Open Society Foundation giving grants to us. It's not by chance that our cooperation with the Nyarchos Foundation has these, has these features mentioned before. 
In Thessaloniki, there was no structure to offer shelter to the homeless. Therefore, we wanted to find a solution about this. After an effort by a foundation in Thessaloniki, we have managed to find the necessary space, the necessary building, and now it is under construction. We wanted to have it as a night shelter for the homeless. Then we managed to get funding from Stavros Nyarchos Foundation. Until the final operation of this shelter, together with Papafion, Praxis, and Okana, there is a hostel at Papafion Foundation offering shelter in combination with other social services, such as offering medical aid and uh, certain uh, food boxes. Now we have more than 100 people being served there. I would like to stress the very successful action with uh, uh, the Nyarchos Foundation grant as regards the future library. And at the same time, I would like to stress that the results, and actually I was personally involved in this, we have quite impressive results. And I hope that uh, Nyar Nyarchos Foundation uh, will go on cooperating with us and we will do more together. So. It seems uh, that uh, we have this social need and we want to do something about it. We have the homeless, the destitute, and so on and so forth. We have economies of uh, scale coming from cooperation between older and newer foundations. I would like to say that uh, this brotherhood who helped us uh, uh, with uh, the shelter existed even from the time of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, Nyarchos Foundation is always active on all social levels. We know what uh, this foundation does in, on all levels. Then we have technology know-how in producing care for the destitute and the homeless in cooperation with other non-governmental organizations. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, before we go to the questions, uh, your questions uh, of the audience, um, I would like um, all the members of the panel to reflect on, um, on a question that I have and that emerged from a series of interviews that I did with foundations on how they work together. Um, the majority of them told me that working together with others is really complicated. It's time consuming, sometimes it's expensive, and frankly, a few of them said, you know, most of the time it's a waste of time. Um, so we only do it when we really, really have to. Um, NGOs, they would say, I'm speaking mostly with foundations, NGOs, they say they are soloist. Other foundations do not have the same approach as we do. Governments think always short term and the private sector doesn't really understand philanthropy anyway. And I'm, ex I'm, I'm saying it in extremes, but this is basically the summary of about 30 interviews that I did with foundations all over Europe. So you are all collaborating actively and I know that you all have struggled in doing so. So one of the things I would hope you would want to share with this audience is um, what kind of lesson did you learn? What do you find to be the key ingredient to what keeps you going uh, when you struggle uh, with foundations that do not respond to you, with uh, governments that uh, are dysfunctional or private sector that doesn't have a clue what you're doing in Ghana anyway. So I don't know who wants to start. I can see you grabbing the sure. microphone. Yeah, I, I can start. Uh, I think just like the uh, other speaker said, T, 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 and T equals I, I would say time is key. And you, you have to have the passion for what you're doing. And if you have the passion, you will make the time. And that probably will mean sleeping less hours in a day. Plus, you can't do this alone without collaboration. Even in orthopedic surgery, it's a multidisciplinary approach. There's no way I can do the surgery without a good nurse or a good instrument. 
So you need uh, cooperative and willing partners. And in an area like Ghana, where we have a depth of expertise, we have to rely on expatriate support, which is the volunteers. So if you have good friends like I have you know, engaged all over the years, over the, over, all over the world, then your volunteers will come in and uh, make available their talents, which is my tea. And then the third tea that I have is the tights. It starts from yourself. I have put in more money than even my donors, which I don't want to mention, but I have a good wife and a good family who understands the meaning of philanthropy. So you, now you can't ask anybody to do something you haven't done yourself, so you have to put in your own resources. Then you have to have willing partners, and in my case, the people who identify with what I'm doing are the patients that I treat. So those patients, understanding what they have gone through and the luck and the uh, opportunities they have can appreciate what is missing in another world and are willing to come to your aid. And then the corporate partners. So it's yourself, your friends, people who believe in your mission, and then the corporate partners. Then you go to the next step, which is the public sector and the, corp and the foundations, the NEAHOs, other foundations that can help. And then you have to go to the government, and you have to have a willing government because they is their host country. And you can't do anything if they don't open the doors for you. So you have to pay homage to them. Uh, you have to be non-aligned. You can't have a party affiliation. And therefore, working with them, they may not be able to give you enough, but at least they'll give you the work coming not. And in our case, the seed money was helpful to get us the land, to get the architectural drawings going. Because until people see that you have erected something, it's difficult for them to just say, take money for your bricks and mortar. And that's what you have to depend on. So the bricks and mortar comes from the local government. And then yourself, your tithes, and then your talents from the volunteers. And, uh, and then you keep going, and you modify it as you grow. Thank you. Martin, you want to reflect on this? Sorry. I mean, as you said, it's a very complicated business partnership, but the one insight I would have is about trust. I can open a door, of, 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 get uh, into the chief executive, I can go and see the senior member of the local authority. The trust is uh, for my staff to get on with their staff. If that happens, the partnership really sings. It's not the senior level relationship that matters, it's that, it's that working relationship that matters. And if in a partnership there's too much reporting back, there's too much holding back, I think it becomes rather a dull partnership. So you have to let go once you've made the first introductions. And you have to be trusting your staff um, on all sides to be really enthusiastic. And I think once that happens, things you don't imagine become possible. So partnership isn't about a plan step by step at the senior level. Partnership, I think, is the, uh, uh, the staff of organizations finding actually they have much in common with each other, they like each other, and they have shared goals together at that level. Um, thanks. Um, I, I, believe, I think that um, when collaborating with uh, other partners, there are more positive than negative aspects. Uh, concerning our experience, it's true that uh, when you start a project with others, um, sometimes the day-to-day -day work is harder, processes go slowly than if you work alone. Mm, because every partner has its own interests, its own states, and even its bureaucracy. But the key, the key question is, in the end, uh, the key question is to share the same objective, to believe on what you are doing, and to have the same mission, and engage this partner. So at the end, the impact of, the, of what you are doing is so much higher if you go alone. So to sum up, uh, when you are collaborating with other partners, you have a harder day-to-day harder -day work but a greater impact. We've had an interesting experience. Ampleharvest.org, I think, as you've seen, is ahead of the curve, which has also meant we're often ahead of the funds. 
uh, it's presented a real challenge. In the program field, we have many, many partnerships. As you've seen, a lot of organizations say, this is wonderful, we want to collaborate with you, and we eagerly want to collaborate with them, whether they're government agencies or they're small nonprofit organizations or even sometimes individuals. When it's come to getting support that ampleharvest.org needs, it's actually been an interesting challenge. Uh, many food foundations say to us, we love what you're doing, but we've never seen anything quite like it, so we can't help you. Keep it up. Um, some foundations, and SNF is a great example, look at ampleharvest.org and say, we see it, it makes sense, and, and they help out. Uh, this has been an interesting um, uh, challenge for us. What I have found is that we're continuing to pursue. Ampleharvest.org is both mission and opportunity driven. We're going to keep on doing what we're doing because it's too important for us. Uh, it, it would be too, much, too damaging, I think, if we didn't do it. And I, we're just waiting for other organizations to come on board to help support our work as we're uh, moving ahead. The partnerships, the collaboration are vital. And uh, we're actually doing this now on a global scale in terms of sharing the information with other similar organizations in other countries, including here in Greece, so that the experience that we have, the, what, the knowledge we've accumulated can benefit other countries. And we're going to continue to do that because I think it's the right thing to do for any organization. Uh, my experience is that uh, usually public servants are, uh, I would say, hostile to collaborating with uh, people working in NGOs or other groups of people that are volunteers or whatever. They either think that uh, they're going to be you know, out of the job or they think that uh, they're, they're the, the, the law quality will be, uh, let's say, brought up to light. Uh, I think, but I think this can be overpassed. I mean, this is my experience. We can, we can overcome it. Uh, I think that uh, one of the biggest problems we have faced the last two, three years, especially the crisis, is the word philanthropy. Now, people who are the receivers of any kind of, of, of philanthropy, uh, they are used to welfare, to social welfare. So they, they feel kind of uh, insulted when they, they receive philanthropy. So uh, we haven't yet uh, haven't, uh, achieved in, in, in finding a better way of making, uh, making it uh, you know, easier, not hurt their pride. Uh, Rich people give money or food or clothes to poor people. And much less, the newly poor people are, um, uh, I would dare say, much, much more um, ashamed of the, of the, of the situation. Uh, we haven't found the, definitely the, the solution, how these three, uh, let's say, um, centers receiver, public service, and uh, NGOs or other uh, group of people should work, especially for, for food and, uh, and clothes and things. In other, in other uh, sectors, like uh, uh, garbage collection systems or cleaning the cities, we have adopted in, in Saloniki a, 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 a a kind of plan which we have uh, baptized as uh, I love my city, I adopt my neighborhood. And uh, this is, uh, we have many groups of people who are uh, trying or uh, they try to be uh, more useful to their, to their neighborhood through many things, through many ways, from uh, taking care of elderly people or from uh, taking care of the green in their neighborhood and things like that. But I would dare say that uh, in Greece we are, we are not yet uh, well, uh, our culture on, on, on uh, participating in, in, in common things uh, is, not, is not yet very, very developed. Thank you. Um, I wonder if there are questions in the audience, yes? Yes, I would like to make a small point for Martin's presentation, which was very interesting. 
clearly from um, the previous presentation of Kasparov, of Kasparov and also uh, of Martin of the Carnegie Foundation, education is the key to change the mindset. What you do is very impressive, but building a library is like having Alexander without the books or Louvre without the paintings. I would think that it's more for considering the leverage of the time element to move faster to the leverage of the impact. Uh, you have to, to select the, the content of the library, the actual books you select. Uh, having an Alexandria library everywhere in the world would facilitate a faster change of mindset all around the world. So that's the case. Do you want to respond to that? I, I, there's a lot of truth in, in that and a good observation. I suppose from our point of view, the challenge of the 20th century was actually getting people able to read books because it is extraordinary to think that 100 years ago that you really didn't have access to books. Uh, it was unusual to be able to read a book or to afford a book. The challenge of the 21st century is access to the digital infrastructure. And that's why I mentioned islands. So you have more than 200 inhabited islands in Greece and we have these 94. They are extraordinarily difficult to bring into the, to the digital world. So I would say, from our point of view, libraries remain our passion, but our focus at the moment in the 21st century on this issue is on digital participation and digital access. That will transform a whole range of opportunities for people in a range of remote and urban communities, frankly. Maybe we can hear some comments from the Greek organizations here present in terms of how they how they look at their partnerships with um, municipal governments, with private sector. Um, I, I was painting this picture from based on European foundations, but I will immediately admit that I don't know what the kind of struggles are that you have in working together with other organizations. I cannot convince you, right? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yes, Mirt. Hi. Um, well, I'm, I'm from the Stavros Nechos Foundation, not from an NGO, but it's a related question, so I thought I'd ask. Uh, Mr. Butaris, um, I understand the role of the, of the local government and more recently rather than, than earlier to collaborate more with the local organizations, but does it also assume a role, an increasing role, in helping them collaborate between them, provide, providing a platform uh, for their collaboration? Most of them serve many uh, overlapping populations in, in need. So is that something that uh, in Thessaloniki and perhaps his uh, other mayors in other cities have thought of? Thank you. Well, uh, overlapping uh, between uh, different uh, NGOs or groups of, of active people is not uncommon. But uh, uh, as far as I can say, I haven't met uh, NGOs or group of uh, people who have not collaborated well together. The problems that appear, they're easily solved. As soon as there is a good will to solve it, you can easily solve it. If you don't want to solve it, it cannot be solved. I don't know if I answer your question. This is, this is hi. Uh, thank you, panel, first of all. And uh, this is probably a bit more related to what Mr. Evans was talking about, bold experimentation. And um, from the side of foundations, a lot of the times there's this hush-hush attitude about things that don't go wrong or even trying to attempt a risky uh, ex experimental plan of action um, in a risky area of intervention. And this seems to impede the sharing of information of what works, what doesn't. And f foundations are in the position because of their role in society that if it doesn't work, uh, they're not going to get extra support or the reputation is going to be at stake. How much do you think that impedes both foundations and large NGOs and how do we tackle that? I mean, Dan Pelota's TED Talk brought this to attention a little bit, and I think people are discussing it more and more, but any approaches, ideas? Thank you. Go ahead, yes. Um, it's a very, very good question. 
The, the first is to have uh, excellent internal governance structures. I'm not talking about taking risks as gambling. I'm talking about clear, uh, thoughtful risk-taking. If, if it's worth doing, it's worth putting your reputation on the line. Now, I have an internal audit committee. The trustees employ external auditors to, to audit me, and I have to give an annual impact report about every project that we do. So if your internal governance processes are there, when things go wrong, they are clearly less expected, uh, but you have a, re a range of reasons. So governance first. Secondly, we should never be f fearful of failure. Chief executive should be, uh, because I think quite rightly, if you have a series of bad decisions, you should go. The trust shouldn't be. So it's a matter of have you appointed the right chief executives within the right structure, who are going to take the risks that trustees want them to take, and if their judgment is poor, find another one. There's plenty of them out there, frankly. And the last thing is, and I've, I've brought a number of copies of the book of our 100 years, is that we have had some fantastic failures. Uh, they are better written about if they're a few decades ago. Like any chief executive, I'd rather talk about the failures of my predecessors than my own. But they have made the trust. If we look, I'll give you one example. In the 1930s, uh, the UK government said to us, there's lots of unemployed people in the cities. Would you give each family uh, three acres and uh, let them fend for themselves? Yes, we said, fantastic idea. And for five years, we gave families three or four acres, and they starved on these small holdings. They weren't big enough to farm. They couldn't get an income from them and uh, we closed the program. Now, at the time, I thought that would be a devastating thing to, uh, uh, to do. How quickly you can admit your failures, it depends on how confident you are as an organization. I would hope we are confident these days, but uh, hey, if it's my mistake, I may not tell you. Could I address something there? I, I think in the nonprofit realm, innovation is critical and innovation doesn't come without risk. Some attempts at solving problems won't work. But smart attempts, even risky attempts, will, but they should be given the chance to try. And um, it should be done intelligently. I'm not talking about being reckless, but you know, a book that I followed closely is What Would Google Do? And in the book, it's very clear. If you're not making failures, you're not taking enough risks. You need to occasionally make a mistake to move, to move on and be successful. And that works really well in the for-profit world, and I, I think it really should be applied equally in the not-for-profit world, because I think it will allow the not-for-profit, the people who are solving problems in the not-for-profit world to accomplish as much as the people in the for-profit world actually accomplish in their pursuits. We have a question at the back, please, yes. This is mainly directed at um, the mayor of the Saloniki and Martin Evans. Um, you're working at different ends of the same spectrum. Um, Martin, you've worked with municipal authorities for many years, and I suppose you're talking to politicians, and I suppose politicians change, and some years down the line, the agreement that you had, perhaps, um, I'm asking, this is a question, um, perhaps there are examples of a new political authority saying, sorry, we've got now to make some cuts, and we promised that we are going to have uh, the staffing on our budget, and unfortunately, we cannot fulfill that promise anymore. And to the mayor of the Saloniki, um, if, um, and I recognize your goodwill, and so uh, you are going to be making uh, agreements with non-governmental organizations and foundations on behalf of the municipality. How can you make sure that your successors, 10 years down the line, uh, will respect the agreements that you're making now? Thank you. Well, you know, we cannot be sure. There's no way to be sure. The thing is, if you have a contract, if you have a well-organized contract, then uh, chances are with your side. And it's not only the contract. If the program is good, and if, if the program 
uh, gives to the beneficiaries, gives a good atmosphere, then nobody can change it, I can assure you. The thing is that uh, if we can, uh, apart from the, the, a certain program, program, if we can raise the consciousness of the, of the, of the citizens, if we can make uh, the, the, the citizen society to work uh, with care about uh, uh, the neighbor, then things will go much, much better. Um, <clears throat> things do change, and that's absolutely clear. And uh, the example I have in my mind are where, as I said before, we would donate a library on a certain condition that uh, the library would be uh, staffed and have the books by the local government. And uh, libraries are closing all over the United Kingdom, including Carnegie libraries. And, our, and we get a, I get a letter most weeks, maybe two or three, uh, uh, about a threat to a library. And we've had to think very carefully about this because it was a partnership. And whilst we gave the building, there was a, the partner spent uh, over 60, 100 years of supporting that building. So our line is this, if there is local support for that change, uh, why would we interfere? If that building can continue to having a good use, that's for the community to decide. If the building is redundant, and these are some of them very old buildings, and there's a new building that's better, why should we interfere? So we are criticised a lot by campaigners for taking that attitude, but our line is this. We have valued that partnership for all those years. They are in difficult circumstances and making difficult decisions. We will not uh, make an easy stance and say, don't close the library. What we will say is we will support the decision if it's made in the open and there's good reason for, for it. On the other hand, we will briefly say this, when we donated playing fields, we made one condition. Should you ever wish to build on that playing field, you have to have my permission, not my permission, the chief executive's permission. Uh, and we won't give that permission whilst it remains in ownership of a community. We'll say, if you want to build on it, no, give it back to us. We will realize a profit from that land and then we'll redistribute it in discussion with you, but we will not let uh, uh, that be there. So uh, that's part of partnership is things change and you have to respect the partners, deeply respect the partners' uh, uh, pressures, which are important, and different interests than your own. Yeah, more questions there. Hello. Uh, my question is about cultural differences in the way people get engaged in all your efforts. Um, I really like the comment of Mr. Butaris about uh, the word philanthropy. The, the interesting word today in Greece is not philanthropy. It's more it, it more, it has to do more with engagement, civil engagement. Even the word volunteering would be wrong to describe the recent phenomenon that uh, research has um, shown very recently the 40% rise in community activities in Greece in the last three years only. Um, people that are engaged in those interesting uh, initiatives do not call themselves volunteers, and, the, and they would never identify with the word philanthropy. Uh, but still, it is happening, and uh, even though Greece does not have a tradition in volunteering, as the United States or England have, um, it does have a tradition in housekeeping, and if you look at the villages, people were always involved in the common good of the, of, of the, the population. So the question is, have you ever, in, in, in the success of your own initiatives, do you see those cultural differences that uh, made you change certain practices, for example? As you said, there is no, there is no book how to engage civil society. You each have to reinvent it on your own. Um, my question is about um, observations in cultural differences. Can I start with that? For those of you, if you remember the map I put up with all the red dots on it of the United States with all our registered food pantries, you may have noticed a line right down the center of the country. We can't figure it out either. But to the east of that line, 
we have a very good density of food pantries, also along the Canadian border and on the Pacific coast. But from Texas on up to our heartland, many fewer food pantries. We, there seems to be a cultural divide. This is not an issue of coming to Greece or another country seeing a cultural divide. I'm talking about within the United States. So even within a, within a country, you're going to find differences, and we're still grappling, along with some of our partners, other food organizations who are similarly having challenges in that part of the country, why the messages don't take or how they have to be tweaked a little bit. We do know that we have to get more uh, Spanish content up for the southwest, where we do have Hispanic uh, population. But up in the heartland of the country, it's not a language issue. There is something else, and we are grappling, but we're pursuing it because it's necessary. Um, the other thing I want to say is that, as I talked about ampleharvest.org model being replicated on a global scale, it is not a cookie cutter solution. Every country would have to take it and tweak it to their own legal system, their cultural system, their agricultural system. In the few days I've been here in Greece, I can already see how it would have to be very, very different from what I'm used to in the States. But the point is that organizations can take a model and make it work wherever it happens to be using the local um, experience, and then they can make it work perfectly there. Uh, I think you make very good points, but you know, in, in Africa, especially where I come from, we have extended family uh, environments where you could have five generations in one big roof working together. That's changing to the nuclear family where people are becoming more urbanized. So in that sense, when families are helping each other, even in the same house, um, one can help another family just because they are together and they don't consider themselves as volunteering. But when you leave your comfort zone and you go somewhere else where you've never been before without pay, I think that would be volunteering. But at the same time, it also brings the, the, uh, the challenge of culture. Uh, and that the onus is on the person introducing the other person to that environment that they are properly educated on the cultural differences if you understand it, and I, you have to. And I, if I take someone to Ghana, I have to make sure that they get properly oriented on what they're going to be facing. So education on the part of the leader for the participant is, is also very important. And then in, in healthcare, you have to have culturally competent practices. Uh, and even when it comes to interviewing the patient, uh, a mother, a, a female, a male, with the examination. So cultural competence care is very critical, and I think that's something that should be, if already it's not, in all medical school curriculum, so that we will know how to approach people of different uh, backgrounds so that we don't violate any cultural differences that may exist. So we're very much aware and in tune with, with that. Well, uh, I would definitely, definitely agree with Amalia that we must get rid of the words philanthropy and volunteer. First of all, volunteer is a word that came, came up, it was very a la mode in Greece during the Olympic Games. And this is, uh, not very well uh, uh, you know, perceived, but anyway, uh, the, in Greece, uh, I think that we have a very, very strong tradition on, on community feeling. And uh, although we have gone through many, many big changes in the, in the, in the life of Greece, uh, wars and uh, civil wars and uh, whatever, this feeling has not yet been uh, destroyed. Uh, and I can see that when I said uh, during my, my presentation about the Philoptochos uh, Adelfotis Thessalonikis. Adelfotis is a word which is used in for all these old, old companies, uh, which means that we are brothers. Huh? Mm -hmm. So these are, uh, they, they formed a, a brotherhood. And this brotherhood uh, took care of uh, the schools, huh? It's not by chance that the Greek word of dimotiko, it means that it is not a, a, a school by, run by the state. It is a school run by the municipality. Dimos in Greek, in Greek is municipal. Huh? So uh, it's, not, it's not easy to overcome these things. And uh, I'll tell you that uh, 
uh, one thing which was really very, very surprising. We've been, uh, we started working about a year ago uh, on this program of uh, Greek, German, uh, local governments for exchange of, of uh, local, of uh, good practices and things like that. Now, the German and the Greek uh, uh, structure of local uh, government is totally different. But one thing which is uh, really admirable with them is that they have a way of, of uh, uh, public congresses participating in the way they take decisions. If they want to build a house, they, they, they make uh, 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 councils and councils again and again. And this is a procedure that has been uh, in the DNA, I would say now. It's been a, 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 a culture for, for hundreds of years. In Greece, we have lost, we have lost this, this uh, feeling of co-deciding. And uh, this is, uh, I would even dare say, this is part of the, of, the, of the party system that has ruled Greece after the war. That uh, we don't think on, on, on our community problems, we think on our party problems. And this is uh, suicidal. I mean, uh, it, uh, so I, I just said that I admire the way Germans decide about common things. It's not, a, it's not a, a voluntarism, it's not philanthropy. They decide about what they're going to do for the poor people. Uh, and they, don't, they are not philanthropists. Uh, they are not uh, volunteers. They are active, civil, uh, active, active citizens. And this is, I think this is, should be the, the most uh, the preferable uh, word, active citizen. Not a philanthropist, not a volunteer. I am an active citizen, or whatever. I just want to commend uh, this <coughs> program of uh, volunteer corpor uh, corporate that we have in La Casa. No? Uh, the employees from La Casa, La Casa is a bank, so uh, its employees have a um, high knowledge on accountability, on finances, on marketing. And when they go to support these uh, projects of rural development in Latin America and in Africa, they offer this knowledge to the uh, rural cooperative, mostly cooperative of women, that are uh, that try to uh, to build up a, a small company, and that we we want to see as entrepreneurs at the end. No, and this is a very interesting process because because it's a double way. No. These employees uh, offers their knowledge to these uh, rural communities, but they know they uh, learn a lot because they live for a month in a uh, in another country which have a really different reality with sometimes really hard context, but with people who, uh, who are fighting every day, you know, to give food for his family and to have a life with uh, dignity, no? So when these uh, volunteers come back, they say, I mm, help these people, but I learn a lot for my life, no? So this is a, pro a process that it's very rich for both parts. Thanks. Um, been quite a lot of mention over this conference about paradigm shifts. And the, word, uh, the phrase comes from a book about 50 years old now about the nature of scientific revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. I think we genuinely are in a paradigm shift, and it's this. Between the post-war welfare state and what's going to come into the future, and it's not we're going to throw everything that we've gained in the last 50 years out. We are just saying how we have, have we got the right, right relationships between individual family responsibility, community responsibility, and governments. And we were drifting into this idea that government should do everything. And in most countries in the, in the EU, that was kind of broadly the way it was going. We have a, a small program called the Enabling State, which I've just tweeted, which is a, an examination of this. We're not trying to predict what the future is. We are describing this 
upheaval. And what Thomas Kuhn was saying about scientific revolutions, don't believe it's all rational. People feel passionately, words matter, how you describe things matter. So if you're saying philanthropy, no, uh, engagement, yes, somebody else will say the opposite. It, it's great, it's what George Soros was saying, discourse and disagreement will get us to the next stage. And I think, I, I'm glad that the word paradigm shift has been used because if we won't see the solution you know, in a year or two years time, but I think it's so fantastic to be working through it. And I do think foundations have some intellectual uh, capital to put in there as well as some cash. And that could be one of our contributions, working with politicians uh, to find the solutions for the next 20 or 30 years. We have one final question. Uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's less, less of a question, I think, more than a statement. And I come back to your question and to, to Mayor Spotari's um, statement that we have not learned to cooperate. I mean, I'm a Greek. This is, yeah, so I come back to your question on how can we leverage on cooperation. And I think, um, if I may uh, look back and try to understand what cooperation has meant in this country, mainly social issues, perhaps we lived in the notion that to share means to have less individually. Each of one has less. And I think we have to learn that to share now means each of us has more. And I think this is the new paradigm. This is what we have to learn, that if we cooperate, it's a win-win model at the end of the day. It's not a, a, a zero-sum game. And this is something which uh, we might learn again to experience. It's my statement. Thank you. Thank you so much. You solved my problem by making a statement and not a question, <laughs> because I will run over time if not. I. Um, I think we had a very interesting exchange that went a little bit all over the place, but um, I, I did learn a lot, again, um, that collaboration is about communication. So it means also that it is about language, which words do you use with whom. It's about time and timelines. Do you invest time? How are your timelines compared as a foundation compared to a government, for example? It's about our ability to fail and to adapt when we fail and to learn, as we learned this morning from George Soros. It's also about information. We haven't touched on that a lot, but it's about information that connects us and not information that is thrown at us, uh, but that really connects relevant actors. And in the end, I think, and I, it resonates very much with uh, my own experience. It is about trust and managing expectations. Um, so I want to thank you all for having patience with us and with this panel. And then I think we hand over to the final speakers of the day. Isn't that true?